It is believed to be approximately the 41st millennium. The Imperium of Mankind, Humanity, are not even entirely sure of the date anymore. So shrouded in the past is any vestige of truth, certainty or enlightenment. Yet this is actually of no moment. For no matter the exact date, all know the present era is one of darkness and terror, a never-ending war. Yet in all of the galaxy, there is but one light to lead the way, one shining bastion of honor, enlightenment, and fecundity. And its name is Ultramar. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemot, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and important places of the Warhammer 40k universe. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we are to briefly explore one of the most important regions in all of the million worlds of the Imperium. It is by far the most important sub-realm in all of the human star-spanning empire, and is second only to the birthplace of humanity and the seat of the Emperor himself, Terra, being the name of Earth in this era, in the Sol system. And it is here that we see the greatness of the dream that the Emperor dreamed, for Ultramar is the meanest and faintest echo of that magnificence but it is the closest thing to the dream in all of the regions over which humanity still holds sway. And it is unique in many, many ways. From there being no imperial tithe on this region, its resources being directly controlled and administered by a chapter of space marines, all of the way to its almost halcyon standards of living for the very common folk of the land. These issues we will discuss in due course, but let us not throw shade over some of the most important aspects of this entry by ignoring some of the matters that are so very rarely discussed. For, in my mind, the true uniqueness of Ultramar is as much in its pre-imperial history as it is in its staggering contribution to the armies and forces of humanity from the time of its discovery until the present day, some 10,000 years or more later. It can be said even without a hint of hyperbole, that of all of the worlds and areas in the human empire, none have been more important to the continuation of the Imperium and very survival of all of humanity. For every region, hegemony, principality and state has it their capital, their seat of power, of governance. They also have their breadbasket, their trade centers and homes of martial culture. A region that has always been the backbone of its armies or its supplies a region that's existence and prosperity or hardiness has been fundamental to the survival of the whole. And for the Imperium of Man, it is inarguably the 500 worlds. It is, and always has been, Ultrama. For without this powerful and disciplined empire within an empire, then surely the Imperium would have fallen. And this is not merely concerned with the horrors that have been halted directly by the forces of Ultrama. Not even then. It is also due to the phenomenal amount of men, equipment, resources and ultimately the amount of space marines that are generated by the people of Ultramar that are then distributed out to the wider Imperium on a needs basis. The pedantic old ghouls amongst our flock will immediately point to the fact that chapters are made by the Adeptus Ministorum from the gene stocks on Terra, which is also irrefutable. But it is the sons of Rabud Gilliman with the most stable gene seed and being most prolific of all Adeptus Astartes, all really descended from Ultramar, that permit the forging of most new chapters. Hence, if Ultramar did not exist, if the 500 worlds fell, 
then the entire process of forging these new chapters would be hindered to such an extent that the process may well break down entirely. For many also forget that for every tale of space marines riding in on their bikes or being dropped in by drop pods and destroying all about them, there are as many where they are fought to a standstill, or worse, slaughtered like calves. Hence will the generation of new chapters always be an ongoing requirement. Always. But I digress. So let us take this entry step by step, and let me show you one of the most beautiful things yet remaining in this oak-so-terrible setting that is the stuff of nightmares. Let me show you the wonder and power of the realm of Ultramar. Ancient history, an island in an ocean of insanity. As stated in the introduction, it is considered to be the 41st or the 42nd millennium, and much has happened since the naive times we live in now. For humanity progressed and gained more and greater technological marvels with each passing year. We learned about our world of birth, plumbing its deepest oceans and its highest peaks. Then when we had done this, not so very distant in the future to now, we expanded our reach into the solar system. Luna, the moon, Mars, then outward to Jupiter and the fringes of the system. We colonized it all. We learned how to move across space and expand, slowly at first, but always pushing out. Eventually, humanity came into a golden age, where we learned to travel faster than light, and from there we pushed out faster and faster. Many races were met, the Elderai, the Orcs, and others. A variety so dizzying that it prevents listing in a brief entry. The Golden Age, which is now called the Dark Age of Technology by the Imperium, meant that none could truly threaten us. Well, none who cared at any rate. The Eldar were the only race truly capable of doing so, but they were declining and insular, and cared more for their increasingly extreme and grotesque pleasures than they were with controlling a galaxy of which they had become bored. The armies and fleets of humanity were endless, their power beyond the conception of humans of this present era, and definitely beyond the hopes of the denizens of the grim darkness of the 42nd millennium. Yet our culture was not warlike. Hence it was that we, humans, were spread across the galaxy, yet clustered around the known warp travel lanes and nodes, so not in every region or every sector, but it would be no exaggeration to state that humans were as plentiful as the stars in the sky. It was an era more akin to the hopeful vision of a utopia, than any one might wish for. We had STCs, standard template constructors, that could make nearly anything that was required from a database of the sum total of human knowledge. Our armies evolved into being filled with metal androids known as the Men of Iron. None dared challenge us then. But it was not to last. In a perfect collision of a million different events and factors out of our control, some larger, some smaller, it all contributed to the coming age of strife. And humanity fell. It began with the men of iron and all artificial intelligences that had previously been so close, so reliable, so helpful to humanity. They turned on us and nearly wiped us out. Despite the power of humanity at the tail end of the golden age of technology, it took assistance from anyone and literally everyone that humanity could get on board. Only then, only then were our own creations stopped. Only then were the men of iron destroyed. Our hegemony reeling from this near-fatal blow, things suddenly got even worse. Our ships were suddenly unable to travel due to warp storms, each and every world cut off from the greater whole. The complicated pattern of interconnectivity and cooperation that had been the crowning virtue and power of the Golden Age was twisted into a death sentence for countless worlds and trillions upon trillions of their inhabitants. Psychic beings were born amongst us and proved to be the Trojan horse that permitted the forces of chaos to run rampant on worlds without count. With no experience of this, no way to communicate with the greater human race, meaning no surviving plants could pass on their skills, tips and warnings to any others, 
So every single event was a surprise. Every infestation of the demonic, every psycho dominating entire populations, every cult that attempted to tear down civilizations. And far too many of them were successful. And so, populations cut off from their food chain, supply lines, often descended into barbarity. And on many worlds we regressed into an almost feral existence. The remaining races of the galaxy saw their opportunity, and many simply took from us what they wished. Our worlds, our resources, our freedom, our very lives. Humanity was accosted from all sides, and our light nearly guttered out. It was then that the warp becalmed, and travel was possible again, but only after thousands of years of open season. But why is this so important when discussing Ultramar itself? Because in all of this, the warp storms, the AI rebellion, the hardship, the constant attacks from Xenos empires, practical forces, slavers, conquerors and demons, when all of the rest of the galaxy burned, still, there was one place that held out. It was a shadow of the glory of the past. It was barely alive and holding its own, but it existed. And it was McCrag and the surrounding worlds, what is now the very heart of Ultramar. So even during the darkest of days, this horror of a period called Old Night, even then the people of Ultramar showed their strength, their tenacity. In not merely surviving, which was accomplishment enough, most would say, but because they also strove to move forward. They strove to not only retain what they had, but to try to regain the glories of the past. And so it was that the people of Ultramar kept contact with other plants in their region using sublight ships. So even before the Imperium, before the coming of the Emperor's Crusade, even before the arrival of the Primarch Reboot Gilliman, before all of that, McCrag and the heart of Ultramar were ever special a bastion of wisdom and sense, in a period of ignorance and anarchy. And it was unto this culture that a son from the skies was born, a Primarch, Reboot Gilliman. The Primarchs were the genetic sons of the Emperor, twenty super-soldier demigods to lead the twenty legions of his post-human warriors, the Astartes, the Space Marines. With these empowered beings as his lords and generals, the Emperor of Man was to retake the galaxy one huge push, one massive endeavour called the Great Crusade. It was aptly named, as it would be a flaming sword that would hack and burn all that resisted it. For humanity had gotten back off its knees, helped up by the greatest human our race has ever known, the being known as the Master of Mankind, the Emperor. And he... And we, as an entire race, were angry. Angry at the fall from grace. Angry at the Xenos, the aliens who had once been allies or nuisances that then turned on us. Angry at the galaxy and every welt and bruise that had given our beaten and battered peoples across the innumerable stars. The ultimate weapons of the Emperor, the Primarchs, had been made with knowledge and power stolen from the great gods of chaos. They were not happy with this turn of events, however. Thus did they take the infant Primarchs and spread them throughout the galaxy. Not able or willing to destroy them, yet they would prevent the Emperor, the person they called the Anathema, from having his greatest tools. And so the Emperor led his armies alone, but he led them out from terror, earth, and burned across the galaxy nonetheless. With each world they encountered, with each system they visited, the Great Crusade brought fire and wrath and revenge to the enemies of humanity. Where we were enslaved, we were freed. Where we were slain, we would be avenged. And in so doing, the Great Crusade found one after another of the mighty Primarchs. It would be a leader, proclaimed a hero, a prophet or a god. And most of the worlds that they had landed on, they swiftly dominated and they began to raise up. Some say that the Primarchs were only intended and only ever capable of war. But in Reboot Gulliman, in the Avenging Sun, the Primarch to land on Mighty McCrag, this statement was proven utterly false, in a manner and to a magnitude that few other Primarchs even approach, Rogel perhaps, or the Phoenician before his fall. But in Reboot Gulliman, 
So much of the power of the Primarch's preternatural prowess seemed to reside in the propensity to build, to learn, to absorb, and to then enhance. All of the Primarchs were genius levels of intelligence, huge and nigh on physically invulnerable, peerless on the battlefield, either as warrior or leader, but in reboot, the vision of what could have been, what could have been achieved by these godlike beings if history had not been so tragic. It shone like a lighthouse, like a blazing star. This is not a report on the legend of the Crusade and Imperium, Reboot Gilliman, but it is almost impossible to understand Ultramar itself without at least a passing knowledge of this titan. Reboot fell to the surface in a capsule, as all of the Primarchs did. When he was found by the local aristocrats out hunting, he was surrounded by a corona of power, a brilliant light. The lords looked upon him and saw something very special in this being, this perfect child. And so it was that Reboot was adopted by the most powerful of the feudal lords of Macrag. There are many tales from this time, but we shall deal with them when we explore Reboot himself. For now, it is best to skip forward and see the end results. Reboot Gilliman matured supernaturally quickly. He absorbed all information given to him. He excelled at everything compared to a normal mortal, but his greatest skills always lay in logical assessment, organization and, of course, the art of war in all of its intricacies. Reboot wrestled power from a corrupt clique of nobles that had assassinated his adopted father. Henceforth, for this action, he would always be called the Avenging Son. He went on to take his broom to every single nook and cranny of the civilization, organization, executive, democracy, military, agriculture, manufacture, resource management and distribution. And he transformed his world. He took the very best and left all the rest, as they say. Then he applied his incredible mind and abilities to the improvement of the lives of nearly every soul on the crag. And in so doing, he set his trajectory for the rest of his existence. He got things done. Not for the one, not for himself, not for a king or a country or a planet even, but for every person he ever met, no matter their history, strata or significance. He understood that the health of the one is reliant on the many. By building a strong and prosperous, healthy and happy populace, he could harness resources beyond the dreams or wit of any petty dictator and all followed him willingly, for it was almost impossible not to follow him. He had their best interests at heart, but unlike so many visionaries, he had the ability and the drive to see it through. No task or challenge was ever beyond him, and his progress was the progress of his entire people. He swept away simony and nepotism and incompetence wherever he found it, forming a new meritocracy that simply did everything better than the old corrupt feudal houses. Reboot then took the small vessels McCrag had used for limited inter-system travel and organized them too. He improved, commissioned new ships, brought advance and progress to the stars in his locality. An onward momentum that never skipped, never stopped. Reboot was a machine. He never tired. He never could. And it was when the fledgling empire of Macrag, of Ultramar, met the outriders of the Imperium's Great Crusade, that everything finally made sense. The Avenging Son, Reboot Gilliman, finally met his father, his creator, the Emperor. And in that instant, he knew why he existed, who had made him, and what he had to do. Without hiccup or hesitation, the Great Crusade brought the enthusiastic Macrag and its lords into the Imperial fold, and Reboot was given command of one of the legions of Astartes, the Space Marines. They were the 13th Legion, and were the diluted copies of his splendor. They were the Ultramarines. And as he had done with Macrag, with Ultramar, Reboot did unto his legion. Reboot learnt all of their doctrines, all of their few inadequacies. He consumed the Principia Bellicosa, the Emperor's own book of war, and every ancient treatise he could get his hands on. Scholar though he was, he then applied them, and he showed the difference between good governance and bad rule. The Culture of Ultramar Unlike so many of his brother Primarchs, he did not see the Legion, the Astartes and the Crusade as anything separate to the civilian population. 
where many legions of marines were distant, if not downright dismissive of their hosts and the wider humans of their new imperium, it would never be thus with Raboot and his legion, the Ultramarines. Raboot saw that the Astartes were merely a wing of the Imperium, were always intrinsically reliant on those that some deemed lesser, as much as the populace were on them. They were one. And by this realization, Raboot discerned that the race as a whole need work together toward one purpose, one goal, the dream. From that day onwards, even up to this day, McCrag and all of Ultramar have never paid the Imperial tithes. The entirety of Ultramar and all of its resources are primarily given over to the maintenance of that mighty legion, now chapter, the Ultramarines. For the entire culture of Ultramar is like unto a pyramid, and at the pinnacle of the structure are the Space Marines, but not separate. They are as reliant on every brick that forms the base and every brick between and so they take care of each and every echelon of their culture to the best of their ability with the resources at their command, but always seeking to improve. Unlike so many, they prioritize standard of life over raw short-sighted production quotas, but by doing so, they are always playing the long game, as ever their sire did and as ever he taught them. By preserving the land, the seas, the air, by preventing their befouling, they are actually far more efficient and effective than the vast majority of the Imperium. Resource management is seen as a means to war by them. Hence, it is as important to the Ultramarines as the count of Balta magazines on operational weaponry of war would be to any other chapter of Marines. They see every last ounce, every single endeavor, every vocation and every profession to be a fundamental contributing and driving force for the whole, or they do not do it at all. Modelled on the imagery, many of the naming conventions and the culture of ancient Rome, theirs is a society that has bent its entire functionality to two things, war and business. But when war is not a thing of passion, but numbers, resources and endeavour, then it too is a business, just as with Rome, but a far more idealised version, as it had the guiding force of Rabu Gilliman the equal or likely better than any Augustus for Savian wisdom or any Nias Pompeius Magnus for organization of martial endeavor. Hence the provision of men, materials, armor, ammunition and every single element of war, all of it is their primary concern. There are few more blatantly and all-consumingly martial organizations in all of the Imperium, but certainly none that extend such depths to their very populace. For the Ultramarines are not above and beyond mortals in human society. They are not star gods or distant mystics and heroes from the skies. They are living and breathing examples of excellence that are as visible and engaged as any regent, any lord. And it is due to the way the Raboot set up the entire fibre of the society so that it was so natural, so logical and so fluid when the Crusade arrived and his mighty sons, his Ultramarines, were little copies of his greater light. They slipped into positions of authority with ease and aplomb. The jigsaw that Ruboot had been subconsciously constructing, the perfect weapon of war, the perfect martial society, as far as he could envision it in that period coming out of old night, it became an overnight reality. Families of import, feudal lords and planetary governors, all have statues of their relatives and ancestors who have been chosen to join the chapter in their time. For in Ultramar there is no greater honor no greater reward, and no greater calling than to be one of the Adeptus Astartes, the legendary Ultramarines. Thus it is so with many cultures who provide men who go on to be the Emperor's own angels of death. But they are usually from death or feral worlds. Much like their template, the Sato Kar and Fremen, they are raised as ruthless warriors due to the hellholes that they must survive. But it is so rare for a cultured and technologically advanced planet or region to provide candidates for the chapters, for the space marines. Usually, they simply do not have that killer edge, that rugged tenacity or conviction to become the elite, the most powerful of all of the human warriors who have ever existed. And any grandioso gallant enough to attempt the feat by throwing his progeny or his precocious self at a chapter's gates will usually never last through the training. For the Space Marines are the rarest of our kind, 
for they know no fear. They cannot. Should they break, then all of humanity is doomed. So Ultramar, with all of its culture and what some would consider a pampered life, it still competes. How? It is because, although they are cultured, well-educated by the terms of the Imperium, of course, and incredibly coddled by most standards, each and every one of their population are under zero illusions that if they do not play their part, we all die. They are raised from birth with an idealized vision of the military and an adoration of Raboot Gilliman and all of his sons, his Ultramarines. And there is no waste in Ultramar. So if a man does not make the grade for initiation, he will not be cast out and heckled. He will be put to work in the field he dreamed, if not in the manor. For Ultramar exists under a shield of ceramite and plasteel. Its worlds and systems are blazed with the light of a hundred Bastilles, a mighty fleet, and stations, watch posts, and orbital arrays. To assault any part of the realm is to collide with a wall of resistance from the very outset. One that will slowly withdraw, slowly harass, harry, and erode you. Will fight you for every last inch, every millimeter of land, sea, sky, or void. Its planets also are host to some of the most professional, organized, well-equipped, and trained forces outside of the Astartes themselves. Being an official regiment of Astra Militarum, the Imperial Guard would not like their chances against their planetary defense forces, called the Ultramar Auxilia. More times than can be counted, even by all of the Administratum, it has been these forces that have been called upon to replace the Guard when their casualties have become too high. For many of the plans of Ultramar have a productivity that matches even some war worlds. And it is every world in Ultramar that has these magnificent troops as its first defenders. Due to the prolific rate of the production and elegant organization of the supply chains, even those forge worlds that are within the region are leagues ahead of their competitors in output. Hence the dockyards of Ultramar push out ships of the line, then fully equip and crew them. The navy and void control of the region is staggering. Adding this to the already impressive static defenses, this permits the Space Marines a free hand to act and strike where they are needed most. The Ultramar of the Great Crusade Era After reunification and compliance with the Imperium, the bequeathing of the 13th Legion of Space Marines, the Ultramarines, to Reboot was like a fairy tale. For Reboot meshed with his Legion, as he was always destined to do. They were made to be a matching pair. Primarch and Legion, father and sons. And what a pair they made! For with his supply lines and resources all arranged, Ruboot went on to practice a method of war that was very unlike many of his brother Primarchs, yet no less effective by any stretch of the imagination. Where his berserker brother Angron would cull his own men if they did not meet unmatchable deadlines, Reboot treasured every single man under his command. Where the Lunar or Space Wolves would charge into battle and crush their enemies with daring frontal assaults, Reboot would always find a way to take the same objectives, but with a radically reduced butcher's bill. He did not do better. He was not better, certainly not in a melee and certainly not as a general, but he fought his wars like a king, one that truly cared for his men. He would win every war set before him, crush every Xenos threat, every cult, every rebellion, but he always mitigated casualties as best he could. Never let anyone say he was weak. He would pay the butcher's bill if required, and his men went to that fate as stoically as a salamander or imperial fist should it be called for. But he treated his marines like the most precious resource. Due to this and the phenomenal productivity he had set in motion in his rear, in Ultramar, the Ultramarines soon became the largest of all Space Marine legions. Dark Angels will always mention the Rangdan Xenocides, before which they were inarguably the largest legion. But that is a deep rabbit hole for another day. And so it was that Ultramar was the rock on which this explosion into the stars was built. Its people trained, equipped, and then sent out to guard, to educate, and to uplift the peoples of the world's reboot element of the Great Crusade had freed and it is few legions that can approach the record of the Ultramarines in their progress, in their conquests, and only a very handful that can state that they achieved more. 
with each world reboot and his sons brought into Imperial compliance, the dream of the Imperium was brought closer to reality. A dream that Reboot had etched on his soul as much as Rogel Dawn did on his heart. For the construction of empires, the creation of beneficial societies, this was exactly what Reboot was created to do. And it all looked so close to becoming a reality. The Imperium of Mankind. The dream of a return to the golden age of technology, but without its inherent weaknesses, like the reliance on the abominable intelligences of AI. For the Great Crusade was as much a fire burning away superstition, religion and ignorance as it ever was against external foes. And Reboot exemplified everything the Imperial truth held most dear. Logic, accomplishment through endeavour, wisdom, enlightenment, honour and sacrifice for the greater whole, for all of humanity. It was so close. But it was not to be. For the War Master, the first found and most favoured son of the Emperor, Horus Lupercal, commander in chief of all of the Emperor's crusading armies. He fell to evil. The galaxy burns. The War Master secretly fell to the seductive blandishments of the Dark Gods of Chaos. Because he was hidden, his fall unknown, he managed to send his greatest threats to the furthest reaches of the galaxy, or into traps of his devising. All of his brother Primarchs that would never, ever turn against their father, the Emperor, were negated as swiftly as possible. For Reboot, his Ultramarines and Ultramar, this was about keeping them busy, keeping them out of the war, as Reboot was utterly loyal and his legion was now the largest. But one could equally say that Ultramar itself was the target of the attacks, not just his marines and his person. The Chaos forces feared the might of Ultramar being brought to bear on them. Hence did Horus send his two most vicious attack dogs to the scene. Angron, the Red Angel, the Primarch of the World Eaters. Berserkers and Barbaric to such a level that they gained censure on a myriad of occasions, even when they were loyal and Lorgar and his word-bearers. For Lorgar had a grudge to settle with Reboot due to the actions at Monarchia, but please see my entry for the word-bearers' legion for these details. Utterly unaware of the hatred in their breasts, the vipers that had coiled around their hearts and made them the most violent and bitter of enemies, Reboot and his Ultramarines were led into a trap on the lush world of Kalf. Kalf, a world in ascendance, and fast approaching the power and import of Macrag itself. When the word bearers began attacking their brothers of the Ultramarines, pandemonium ensued. Despite being utterly blindsided, the Ultramarines quickly regrouped, fathoming the staggering scale of the betrayal. They then fought back. And so the war went on, and on, and destroyed Kalth. Lorgar and Angron went on to attempt to ravage the entire sub-realm of Ultramar, so jealous of it were they. Despite that Lorgar and the Red Angel did this to hurt Reboot, it must surely have been the plan of the War Master himself to gut the productivity of this region as it posed such a threat to his own future hegemony. The battles were vicious as only brother on brother can be. It included the use of some of the largest ships ever witnessed in the Imperium, barring redoubtable facts, of course. But while the two evil Primarchs and their men were fought up and down the sector, Lorgar set off a mighty dark ritual and unleashed the Ruin Storm. A warp storm of such prodigious size and power that it cut Ultramar off from Holy Terror. Suspecting that their Emperor had been slain, Reboot set up the Imperium Secundus. He calculated that the probability of the Emperor being alive was near non-existent. The surprise betrayal from the Emperor's most trusted son, Horus Lupercal, was so unexpected that it surely must have been successful. Without anything else to do, Reboot attempted to keep the fires of the dream of the Imperium going. In Ultramar, it would exist if nowhere else. Eventually, his loyalist brothers Sanguinius and Lion L. Johnson arrived with the Blood and Dark Angels. The Ruin Storm partially lifted, and they discerned that Rogel and Yagatai had held out against all odds and logic. Somehow, those two, with some work from Lehman, had held on and held out, 
terror still stood, the Emperor was still alive. Without delay, they rushed to Terra. Only one legion could get through, so Sanguinius and his blood angels were sent to Terra. El Johnson was to cut off the traitor's retreat, and Reboot was to go beyond them and smash their supply lines. Side note, alas, the full extent of these days are far too complicated to even summarize well. So if you crave more information, please see my entry on Rogal Dawn. But do also consider that each of my entries is from the perspective of the faction addressed. So trust me, there is so much more to tell of these times, and so many more interpretations from differing parties. It is the truth to the Imperial Fists. Our time will come for the Ultramarines when more of the books have concluded and we see the shape of the scouring. A perspective I am very interested to confirm and then provide to you, the gentle listener. All in good time. Side note over. The end result of all of this, the Horus heresy, was that the Emperor survived. But like his Imperium and his dream, he was shattered. The whole realm was. This is pertinent to Ultramar, as Reboot was forced to create the Codex Astartes, the new guiding book and rule of all doctrine. But inside its sheets contained the outline for the chapters, the breaking up of the legions. No longer would they be huge armies, but elite forces of 1,000 marines alone. Reboot realized that power does indeed lead to corruption, so he wished to limit the power of all. Hence the legions were broken up, the armies and navies were separated and given differing command chains, so as to remove the temptation of any warlord to ever again command so many forces that he could perform another Horus heresy, another civil war. But this meant Reboot could not be a hypocrite. He had to relinquish or diminish the power of Ultramar and his own marines. Hence his own legion was broken down into chapters, and Ultramar was then again broken down and only a smattering of systems allowed to be associated with that organization. Ultramar was no longer the 500 worlds, but a dozen or more. The Age of the Imperium With the passing of time, the Primarchs all fell or disappeared. Reboot himself was struck down by the demonic prince Fulgrim, a brother turned to chaos, but he did not die. He was placed in a stasis field, and it was hoped, and then eventually prayed for, that he would one day heal and return to lead them. And thus did Reboot Gidiman's remains become a revered landmark on Ultramar, and then a place of pilgrimage. The Age of the Imperium. Slowly by slowly, year by year, day by day, the Imperium stagnated. Bureaucracy, ignorance, regression, then eventually the Imperial Creed, and religious zealotry and fundamentalism swept the Imperial truth away. The exploits of the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy went from history to legend, then legend to myth. And before anyone knew it, the Imperium was a place of backwardness and fear and pain. It became a rotting corpse. But ever was Ultramar the least affected by these trends. But still affected, of course. Near 11,000 years will do that. Ultramar was adept at administration and fought to resist the excesses of the administratum and its legions of scribes. And Ultramar never descended into the choking smog-filled wrecks that dot the Imperium. It was always administered with good governance instead of bad rule. A veritable utopia compared to the vast majority of the Imperium. All due to one man and one idea. The man... Reboot Gidderman. The idea. Do it right. And you will get better results than merely doing it quickly. Set it up from roots to branches. Organize it and build it from foundations to roof. The Ultramarines have always built to last. They have always considered the welfare of their charges, the common populace of the Imperium, to be their duty as well, you see. Shield of the Imperium. Ultramar is located on the eastern fringe of the Imperium, in the Ultima Segmentum. As such, it has been the bulwark against some of the most terrible threats and enemies that the Imperium has ever known. And Ultramar has the added glory of being the most sought-after zone for despoiling by the demon Primarchs. 
just some of the wars that they have faced. The War of the Beast, with the most powerful orc war since Alanor arose and were only inches away from the utter defeat of the Imperium. It was forces from the Ultramarines and Ultramar that not only assisted in stopping this vast force, but then held the line in regions that had been denuded of forces. They literally patrolled the walls of the Imperium until the local forces recovered. And in many cases, it took generations. The First Tyrannic War, where the very first High Fleet of the Tyranids was encountered. A full High Fleet flew directly at Ultramar and then onto its heart, Macrag. The Ultramarines turned them back. But by doing so, they prevented the fleet from gaining momentum and power. If High Fleet Behemoth had not been stopped at Macrag, then it could well have taken all of that juicy biomass and become an unstoppable juggernaut. It also permitted the Ultramarines to then disseminate the knowledge and experience of fighting the Tyranids to the rest of the Imperium. It permitted the Imperium the time to prepare. The edges of the 13th Black Crusade, where a huge force of Black Legion fell on Macrag, and in their defence on that world, in all of the confusion as the forces from distant Cadia somehow arrived, a miracle happened. The greatest miracle for 10,000 years. Because in all of the madness, somehow, the avenging sun awoke. Reboot Gilliman returned. The Avenging Sun and the Era Indomitus. When Reboot awoke, he swiftly turned back the Black Legion, then went on to Earth in a massive quest. Upon his arrival on Earth, Terra, he then took the mantle of Lord Commander of the Imperium, and to all extents and purposes, the Regent of the Imperium of Man. Reboot had begun the Indomitus Crusade and taken his new army of Primaris Marines out to reclaim the galaxy in a way startlingly similar to the Great Crusade. But Reboot also realized that the galaxy had changed in all the time of his slumber. The threats to humanity so large, so deadly, so real, that his structure of the entire military, as outlined in the Codex Astartes, now required amendment. The times had thoroughly changed during his time in stasis, and the world was so much more grim and dark than he could have ever projected, even in his worst nightmares. And so Reboot began the rebuilding of the carcass that was humanity's empire. He evaluated and identified its few virtues and many failings. And if I am honest, it seems he is the one light in an age of darkness. The one wise man in a galaxy of fools. And so he restored Ultramar knowing full well that he would need every last ounce of resources, he extended Ultramar back to its previous glory. The 500 worlds fell under the Ultramarines again. He would require their excellence to shore up the region, as he now had to concentrate on the Greater Imperium. It is important to know that the 500 worlds now has 10 chapters of Space Marines within its confines. This is far in excess of the usual dispersal, and shows the import of the realm to reboot. But it would never be simply sentimentality or protectionism of his own home. Reboot just saw that Ultramar was that important to the modern Imperium. But this means that there are 10,000 Space Marines presently in this relatively small region. 10,000. The known chapters are as follows. The Ultramarines. The Praetors of Ultramar. The Size of the Emperor. The Knight Cerulean the Avenging Sons, and the Void Tridents, and four more that have not yet truly been identified. That most are new Primaris chapters is purely down to resources, but it is utterly logical and correct for the Avenging Sun to do this when one considers location and history. For Ultramar was then subjected to a massive invasion by another brother and his traitor legion, Mortarion and his Death Guard. But for details of this, we shall again wait for a further entry. Needless to say, that through courage, honor, and determination, the forces of chaos were again thrown back. And that brings us to today. Ultramar stands as the Bastille on the eastern fringe, and it is possibly the most dangerous of all of the regions of the Imperium. On the doorstep of Ultramar are the young and expansionist Tau, their technology improving at a staggering rate. It is also the area which has seen the rise of the Necron Nemosaur and tactical genius, 
Imatek the Storm Lord and his Sautek dynasty. It is where a good amount of the newest high fleets are arriving and pushing forward, and it is where there is a huge orc empire always on the verge of unification and exploding into a potential war. The Ultramines hold off the Necrons, trade blows with the Tower to keep them contained, stand against the Highs, and run infiltration and assassination black operations against rising orc bosses that could unify the Greenskin hordes. And it is in Ultramar that the true light of the Imperium still shines, if nowhere else. Perhaps, if any of Reboot's brother Primarchs can return to help shoulder the responsibility, help fight the internal struggles against High Lord's Ecclesiarchy and all of the little petty men who despise the return of a demigod. Perhaps then, one day, Reboot can return to his home, his love, his first adoration, and make Ultramar the template by which all of humanity can be raised up from their ignorance and misery. It can only be hoped. For how long can one man, even a demigod such as a Primarch, how long can one man stand against all of the universe? Let us hope for the whole of our race the Reboot can be as stubborn, indefatigable and hardy as the realm he created. Let us hope the Reboot will gaze out of the wonders of his contrivance, the fruits of his harvest, the bounty of his ancient toil. Let us hope he can look to a society and realm he created and know that he, like Ultramar, can stand until the stars burn cold. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction to Ultramar. If so, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you do, then hit the notifications button, as I would not want you to miss out. If you see the worth in what we are doing, then do also consider joining our Patreon, or giving the video a share if that is beyond your present scope. It would be a great boon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.